The rest of you go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Uh, last week we started down one path. We were going to preach on walking by faith and not by sight last week. And then um, the, the, we just went a whole different direction. Hallelujah. And, um, but that's okay. You know, I thank God for the Holy Ghost. We can go a different direction and still be anointed. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says this. Um, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And so we started out last week talking about walking by faith. In order to walk by faith, you're going to uh, have to be accepted by him. Amen. And, of course, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please him. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so we have this, um, this, this beginning to what I was going into of living a life that pleases God. Of course, that's living by faith. But at the same time, recognizing that this is not effortless. Now, when I say not effortless, I mean um, you just don't get, come in and get, say, lay down on the couch, look up at the sky and say, Jesus finished the work, and then, you go, and then everything else falls into place. Um, that's just not Bible. It's, it's, it's just it's too many scriptures um, that, that contradict that mindset. And there are people preaching that mindset, and, uh, but it's just not accurate. And so we understand, Paul said we labor, whether present or absent, to be accepted of him. Amen? And we talked about a lot of those things last week, so in Sunday morning and Sunday night. So we want to uh, just let you know uh, that, you know, in order to live by faith, you're going to have to walk in a, play, in a way that pleases God. In other words, you're going, to have to put, you're, you're going to have to want to please God. Yeah, yeah. Now, we're not talking, as we said this, I'm, I'm going to kind of recover a little bit, then we're going to be moving on. We're not talking about, and I grew up classical Pentecostal, so we're not talking about the beehive hairdos and the burlap sack for dresses and the no makeup and that kind of stuff, where you can't, you know, you know and if men have on a short sleeve shirt, they're going to hell, and, you know, if women wear pants, they're going to hell. If women put some makeup on, they're going to hell. Or, you know, it's amazing how much women couldn't do and men could. I'd see some of those men come into church with white shoes on, white pants, a, a pink shirt, a Kelly green coat, and a blue necktie. And a hat with a feather in it. But the woman had to come in looking like a, you know, death warmed over twice. We're not talking about, it's not, we're not talking about that when we're talking about laboring to enter in. We're talking about maintaining a lifestyle and a heart that honors and pleases God and follows after his word and is a doer of the word. Amen. All right, so let's get into this, uh, to faith now. So we just, that was what we kind of got into last week and went off a little bit further in a different direction on that about if we're going to live by faith, we, ought, we, we should be endeavoring to please him. Amen? I mean, uh, I can't quit. A couple of years ago, I, I got into a discussion with someone on the Internet because they were talking about, you know, this, this, this grace, extreme, radical, crazy grace stuff. And... Um, they were saying, you know, they don't have to tithe, they don't have to give, they don't have to go to church, they don't have to submit, they don't have to obey, they don't have to do this. They went out through all the things the Bible tells you to do, that they don't have to do anymore. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. No, as a believer, I tithe. As a believer, I submit. As a believer, I obey those with the rule over me. As a believer, I don't forsake the assembling of myself together, as is the manner of some. As a believer, you see what I'm saying? As a believer, there are things I do that are laboring to be accepted of him in the sense that I do what he told me to do. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you're not doing what he told you to do, it's kind of hard to believe him to do stuff for you. Of course, people teach, well, it doesn't matter. You're going to get blessed no matter what you do. That's not true. We got, Paul wrote into the church at Corinth and said that every man receives... Amen? As he sows. He says, as a man soweth, that, you know, that, that therefore shall also reap. And let every man give, not, not begrudgingly or of necessity. Amen? For God loves a cheerful giver. But, you know, he tells us to do this. We, we do it according to the, what we purpose in our heart. Yeah. Every man as he purposes in his heart. And he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Right. Now, that tells me that if I don't sow bountifully, I'm not going to reap bountifully. And if I lay down and say it's going to come on me anyway, what you're doing is you're sowing nothing, and you're going to get nothing. nothing. Right. Amen. Right. If you don't sow into the kingdom, you're not going to reap out of the kingdom. Yeah. No way around those scriptures. And it wasn't written by Peter, James, or John. It was written by Paul. Because you know, one of the newer things that came out of all this stuff was, don't read Peter, James, and John. They disagree with Paul. And he has the revelation of grace. 
So now we're undoing the Bible. All right. Now, you know, if you're going to live by faith, you're going to have to believe the Bible is the Bible. You're going to have to settle it. We'll say, well, what if we're wrong? No, no. The, see, reading Scripture is a matter of faith. You take it as a matter of faith that it was written and ordained of God. Everything we do is a matter of faith. Amen? You don't need to go to the tomb where Jesus is and argue between the Catholics and the Protestants which one he came out of. You don't need the Shroud of Turin to prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. My faith is not in a, burial, a quote, burial cloth that has an image imprinted on it that they bring out every 20, 30 years for somebody to study. <coughs> Hello? My faith, Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. All right. So now, let's get into faith. You know there are two kinds of faith? Kind of. There's sense knowledge faith, and there's Bible or word-based faith. Amen. Now, sense knowledge faith, everybody want to know who the, the, the leading proponent of sense knowledge faith was? Thomas. Thomas in John 20, 24 through 29. You remember, you remember when the, 12, the 11 had seen Jesus? He appeared to them. Then Thomas comes in later and they say, we saw the Lord. He said, except what? Except I reach forth my finger and place it into the palm of his hands and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Amen. Isn't that what he said? And then, and then so it, later on down there, in verse uh, 26, it says, And after eight days, again, the disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut and, stood, uh, shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas. Now, see, he's listening. I'm gonna this ought to tell you something. Y'all about got real quiet just then. I said, this ought to tell you something. Yeah, you having those conversations in the back corner? Talking about sister so-and-so, talking about the pastor, talking about this or talking about that. The Lord's there. Hallelujah. You spew your unbelief. He heard it. He did Thomas. Isn't that right? I mean, he wasn't there when the other guys were telling, hey, we saw the Lord. Yeah, I won't believe in this, that, 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 that. Jesus shows up, and the first thing he says, Thomas. I say, I say, son, you're full of unbelief. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. He says, Thomas, reach forth thy finger and place it in the palm of my hands. Reach forth thy hand and, and thrust it into my side and be not what? What did he say? Be not what? Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas said unto him, my Lord and my God. How many sermons have been preached on my Lord and my God? This was not a great story. Jesus turned around and rebuked him for that. He said, Thomas... Because you saw me, you believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. He didn't say Thomas was blessed because he believed because he saw him. And we got people preaching, they go and they want to preach a sermon on my Lord and my God. I'm going to tell you something. I want to preach sermons on people who didn't see the Lord and said my Lord and my God. Amen. See, Thomas' faith was sense knowledge based faith. You know, oh, I'm not going to believe I got a new car until it's sitting in my driveway. Well, then that's not believing. It takes absolutely no faith for me to believe there's a chair sitting right there. As a matter of fact, there's 11 or so right across the front there. And several rows of chairs. Are you here? As a matter of fact, I can say I don't believe it and walk and I'm going to trip. Isn't that right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thomas would not believe unless he could see. His senses dictated to him that the only way he would accept the reality of something, this is why I'm going to change it from faith to, you know, the, you know when he would, the only way he would accept the reality of something is to see it, to touch it. His senses dominated him. If he couldn't see it, it wasn't real. If he couldn't touch it, it wasn't real. That is not what God's looking for. If I'm painless, unless, until I'm painless, I won't believe. Until there is a physical manifestation or change of something, I won't believe. Then you're not full of faith. You're right. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it was faithlessness. Mm. Now, don't y'all get up and shout too much right now. I know if I was preaching on the blood, and you could have what you say because Jesus shed his blood, you'd be running by now, but we, you know, we're not, we're, you listen. I like preaching that way too. But the fact of the matter is, we've got to understand, you can't be faithless and expect things to happen. 
You can't be faithless and expect to see changes take place. You do not incur the favor of the Lord through faithlessness. Jesus said to Thomas, you believe because you saw. Or you accepted it as a reality because you saw it. The man who doesn't see it and accepts it as a reality is blessed. He drew a strong line of demarcation there. He separated one realm from the other. The man or woman of faith is blessed when they can believe and yet not see. Now the antithesis of that is this. If you have to see it to believe it, you're not blessed. Down to do that bridge on the river choir thing, you know? Anyway, praise the Lord. I don't have 45 other British soldiers to help me out there. Okay? Thomas demanded physical evidence to satisfy his senses for he, before he would allow himself to accept something as a reality. And we live in a world that way. Don't, do you understand that the reason there is such a push in the, the secularization of the world, to anything that satisfies the senses is to create sense-ruled people to the extreme. And obviously, you know, the, 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 the um, epitome or the, um, the, the zenith of all fleshly things is sexual things. And so we keep pushing people into... Uh, sexual perversion and sexual this and sexual that. Everything is sex. They, they don't sell anything. With, I mean, Hardy sells hamburgers with sex. Hello? Why? Because we want people to go to their most, the, the basis of human instincts and their flesh and be governed and controlled by that. We have now, our, you know, homosexuality is, is rampant. You know, we have textbooks and if you saw if you knew some of the stuff the kids were seeing in textbooks that were in their schools in any fifth sixth seventh eighth grades talking about homosexuality and talk about how to engage in homosexual sex and all this kind of stuff you, you just fall out of your chair and it's being it's being published and put in the schools by our government why because it's because we have an antichrist spirit that's operating in men to drive humanity into being flesh-controlled and flesh-dominated so that they will not believe what they cannot see. Are you here? Because it takes faith to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. Hallelujah. Are you here with me today? It takes faith to believe that which you cannot see. It takes faith to believe in an event that happened close to 2,000 years ago that, you know, that you did not, you're not there. You know, I don't care what the archaeological evidence is. You've got people trying to come along and undo the Bible all the time. You've got people trying to un, 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 undermine, you know, the authority of the Bible. Why? Because they try to do it through the realm of reason. And now you've got Christians trying to reason it out with people and argue it out with people through reason. Wrong path. We're not called to reason with humanity. We're not called to reason the Scriptures. People don't want to talk about intelligent faith. I want to talk about Bible faith. There's nothing intelligent about believing that God took on flesh, came to the earth, walked the earth, died on a cross, shed His blood, went to hell, was raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, and I believe all that. That does not appeal to my intelligence. It is faith in my heart that believes that beyond the realm of reason you can't reason that out <clears throat> and you try to argue that with people and they'll argue right out of it you get into reason with these things and you'll get defeated you'll be like the apostle paul preaching to the king and he says almost thou persuadest me you can't reason people in now and you can't reason the Bible for results. Y'all hear you're going home. Thomas said that's all that call comes out of that realm of flesh. That all comes out of that realm of intellectualism. I'm not against education, but I am I'm against education of your mind at the expense of your spirit. Hello? There's an agenda in every college university today, and that is to undo anybody that believes in God. 
That is their agenda. And, and you know, in your tenure professors and that kind of stuff, they have a goal. They're allowed to, you know, they're allowed to do about anything they want to do to challenge and undo and to tear down and destroy and to break down and then rebuild you back in their communist, socialist, uh, uh, whatever mindset. Now, I know we got some good guys here and there, but, you know, as a general rule, that's, that's your educational system. I, re I read an article over 20 years ago from a professor at MIT, a, a tenured professor at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who's supposed to be one of the leading educational places in our country. And he said, our next goal is to remove the myth of God from the classroom. And they've been working at it for, and getting a pretty good job done at it. That was their goal in the educational system. Now we can't even call Christmas a Christmas tree. Why? Because men, the church has tried to reason. The church has tried to institutionalize. The church has tried to be like Thomas. And, and, and we got to the place where it's, it's got to be seen or touched or held or we don't believe it. We don't believe in the supernatural in our churches. As a general rule. Hello? We have to come back to the place. We're not Thomases. We're not driven by our flesh. We're not governed by what the flesh says. We're not governed by what our senses say. We don't have to reason it out. I mean, you know, listen, divine healing messes people up because they try to figure it out in their head. Come on. How am I going to get healed, you know, and, and not take any medicine? See, we no longer, I know I'm going to make a brashly bold statement here. We no longer in the church as a whole believe God is God. I know we sing it. God is God. God don't ever change. I know my we sing it, we get we get our camp meeting. Go, oh, praise God. But the church doesn't believe God is God. We don't believe God heals. We don't believe God delivers. We we have people believing that Satan's really not a, a person, he's a force. Or he's the puppy dog of God used to attack people. Sickness and disease has become our teacher instead of the Holy Spirit. We don't believe in demonstration of the power of God. We mock it in our churches. Hello? There has to be a return to get out of the mind. See, we, we, we've been trained and educated to think with our minds, to reason with our minds, and to deny what we cannot see. Amen? Sense, knowledge, faith is a robber of real faith. Sense knowledge, if you've got to see it, if you've got to touch it, if you've got to hold it, if you've got to handle it, it's not faith. You, my brother or sister, I say this with kindness, are faithless. But there's hope. You don't have to stay there. Amen. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Amen. Then Hebrews 11 tells us that the, 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 the word did not, mix, um, uh, um, did not profit the Israelites because they did not mix faith with it. Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 4, both of those. In those. Did not, you know, we're going to start mixing faith with it. We're going to believe the Bible. Amen. See, word faith works like the centurion. Isn't that right? They came to Jesus and said, you know, I got a servant at home. He's sick. Will you come pray for him? He's sick of the palsy. Grieves the torment over Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. He says, no, you don't have to come. Now listen, this is a centurion. He's a non-covenant person. He's a non-covenant Gentile. Are you here? But he says, speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. Woo! Yeah. Glory to God. <clears throat> he didn't say, come lay hands on him. When I see him get up, I'll believe you're the Messiah. He said, you speak the word only because I'm a man set under authority. And I say this one go, and he goeth, and this one come, and he cometh. And do another do this, and he doeth it. Amen. And Jesus heard it. He marveled. You know, there are two times Jesus marveled. One place it said he marveled because of their unbelief. Here he marveled 
Because he says this, I've not seen so great a faith, no, not in all of Israel. Why? This guy didn't even have a covenant right to it. And he believed the word. Because he understood you can, you can speak and things happen. He understood that, you know, faith works in a realm not seen with the naked eye. And over and over again, we see this in the ministry of Jesus and throughout the book of Acts. Jesus told, you know, the man, you know, uh, you know um, that the man's daughter was dying uh, and uh, a child was dying at home. Jesus said, go your way as you believe your faith be done to you. And he turned and the next day his servants found him. And it said, you know, that, that, that their child was raised up. He said, when did it happen? And he told them, it was about the same hour that Jesus said, go your way your faith, as your faith, as you believe, so it be unto you. Yeah. He, he started home. He, he didn't drag Jesus. He, no, you got to come. You got to come. You got to come. He didn't try to kidnap him. He didn't pull a Jack Bauer and kidnap him and pull him down there. Make him pray for him. Hallelujah. Are you here? He just believed and went his way. I said he just believed and went his way. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, so we got to understand that word faith, Bible faith, arises above sense knowledge faith. Here you've got, to, you, have a, you have a comparison here between, um, you know, the, um, between the centurion and between Thomas. One had to see it to believe it. The one just says, I, you say the word, I know that's going to do it. Just say the word. Then you got Zacharias. Are you here? And Abraham, remember Zacharias in the temple? The angel appeared to him and said, you know, you're going to, your, your wife's going to have a child in her old age. And he goes, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. He said, how shall I know these things? Isn't that what he said? His wife's barren. And, uh, and the angel tells him what's going to happen. He's going to have the spirit of angel. I mean, you talk about a prophecy. Are you here? You're going to have joy and gladness. Your wife's going to have a son. You know, they, you know he's not going to drink wine or strong drink. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and the mother's womb. Many children are over, over here in uh, Luke 1. And, um, he'll, and the Spirit of God's going to go before him in the spirit of power. Elijah uh, turned the hearts of men and the angels. And, and Zacharias looks at the angel and says, Whereabouts shall I know this? For I'm an old man, my wife, wife well stricken in years. Well, there you go, dummy. See what happens to him? He's stuck dumb until the baby's born. Why? Because your mouth will get you in trouble. And when you start saying stupid stuff, like I won't believe it until I see it, you're setting yourself up for failure. Are you here or are you going home? How many are here? All right, how many wish you were here? Glad you're here. How many wish you weren't here? Don't raise your hand. It's not nice. Amen? And so he's, he's dumb until John is born, and he writes down the name of John as John, because he, he should have been named after him, yeah. as tradition was. And they said, no, no, he's supposed to be named. And he said, no, that's his name. Written, wrote that down. And then his, his voice came in. He couldn't talk. Yeah. We found out right, we found out right, right up on the front end of that deal, if he got to talking to him, John won't come in through Elizabeth. Right. <laughs> his mouth was going to stop it. Hello? And the angel said, you're going to be struck dumb because you didn't believe. I want evidence. I want evidence. Again, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, everybody's looking for some kind of evidence. Want to, let, let me tell you something. Now, I grew up Pentecostal and charismatic. I was, I was, I, I was classical Pentecostal. Came over from the charismatics and got into the word of faith. You know, I've been in all of that. I, I, and I, and I, I love all my heritage. But, you know, even in the charismatics, we, you know, we, we'd want a word. We want a word. We want a word. We want, we want to get in the prayer chair and have somebody prophesy over us. It was the Fruit Loop chair most of the time. You get people prophesying over you, you shouldn't have been saying nothing to you. Laying hands on you. But, you know, I don't want, look, I don't want any, every, every, every yin yang laying hands on me. Got a word for me. I heard Dad Hagen say this one time. It didn't matter where he went. Back in the 50s, remember, back in the 40s and 50s, everybody had the tent revivals. Isn't that right? There's nothing wrong with tent revivals. I mean, that, God used that, and people that God told to do it did it. Brother Roberts had a tent. You know, uh, uh, all, all the guys had a tent. Dad Hagen did because the Lord told him to go to the churches. Every church he went to, somebody prophesied he's supposed to have a tent. 
Now, are you going to believe sister so-and-so who just thinks you ought to have a tent and prophesies it? Or the Lord? Because the Lord told him to stay in the churches. He said he had thousands of prophecies. And, and, and only a few ever were true. And one of the few people he ever listened that he believed and received from was Sister Wilkerson. One of the very few people, he, he recognized her as a prophetess, and she was accurate. I, I, I was there one night when, when, she, when, when a horse in the spirit rode up on the stage with an angel and began to you know, tell him he was seeing the spirit clearer and have more revelation than he ever had before and handed him a note in the spirit. And, she's, and, uh, and then he said about a few weeks later in class, and one day he said, you know, he said, I, I'm seeing more things more clearly and, and, and seeing things more in the spirit than I ever have. <clears throat> well, you, you can follow people who have a track record of being accurate. Yeah. Amen. But, you know, just because, every, you know, you can't, every, you can't give you a word every time you need something from God. You're going to have to start believing and stop yes, looking for a word. Yes, yep, yep. You, um, well, this is my electronic word. You got a word. Right, right. My Bible, my written Bible, my hand, paper Bible's up there. You've got a word that you've got to start believing in the Bible. After, after. Amen. Yep. There are a lot of people who won't believe this but want to hear somebody say, yay, the Lord says. Amen. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And I believe faith can come from a word from God. But you can't live looking for that. God didn't call you every day to call up Sister Dollar Prophet. Hello? One th you, you heard Dad Hagen, you go back and listen to his old tapes. One year, um, uh, somebody was, was having an all-night prayer meeting and called the operator in, in Tulsa. And got, got his, he had an unlisted number. You understand the ministry, a certain ministry gets a certain size. You, you just can't have people calling you. They'll call you all the time. And they'll call you for things like this. He answered the phone and said, hello. And said, uh, said Brother Hagan. Yeah. Well, we're having an all-night prayer meeting. Now, look, we called the operator and told her it was an emergency. And so they, they, they called your number for us. It's really not an emergency. We just wanted to know, what's the word? Have you got a word for us? He said, yeah, but I can't give it. <laughs> Woke him up out of his sleep. You know, I, I'm not going to tell you what he said because he told us in private what he said. You know, he said <laughs> Hallelujah. He didn't cuss, but, you know, I mean, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a resounding blessing. I can tell you that. <laughs> now, let me ask you something. How do you think you're going to lie? They lied to the operator to get through in the first place. And he's going to wake up out of his sleep and be on go for your word. I got one for you. Quit lying. Good night. Or go read your Bible. Yay. We are depending on things to make us believe instead of God's word. We're wanting somebody to give us a special word. We're wanting somebody to lay hands on us and make us get goosebumps. We're wanting things other than what God has already given us. He said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have the written word. We start there. Now, if God chooses, remember, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said this, that, that he has divided, that the, the, the manifestation of the Spirit is given as the Spirit wills. For unto one is given. Now, what? The manifestation of the Spirit is as the Spirit wills. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the prophecy, different, different, especially your utterance gifts that, that, that reveal or declare something, or as the Spirit wills. So what's that mean? Am I lost? No, 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 no. See, we're not called to live on a diet of special words. We're called to live on a diet of the word, written word of God. The psalmist said that thy word is my, necess is, is my necessary food. Amen. Amen. Joshua said this book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Yeah. What? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success, or um, literally uh, uh, deal wisely in the affairs of life. Now let me ask you something. If we are going to live, if we're going to have good success and deal wisely in the affairs of life by meditating and feeding and acting on the written word, why are we going around looking for because why are we going around looking for a special word? Because our senses mm -hmm. want to have a sensatory confirmation. Yeah, right. 
And if God gives you a word, God gives you a word. But we're not to be prophecy seekers. I'm not against it. I believe I prophesy to other people. I said, you know, God uses me. But it's not, it's not on the clock. I, can't, I just don't line you up and run you down the road and say, I got a word for everybody in the building. Been there when that happens. Line them up and prophesy over them. Everybody, you ain't there, you ain't prophesy, everybody turn around and lay your hands and prophesy on somebody. Get your hand off my head. Hello? No, it's the written word that produces faith. Now let me say this. If God so chooses to manifest that way and to use a, a special word, so to speak, a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, a prophecy, something God uses in, in, in that, it should <clears throat> already confirm what God's placed in your heart. And if it doesn't, you don't need to act on it. Until it's real to you. Now, it should confirm what's already in your heart, and number one, and primarily more than anything, it should be in line with the written word. In order to have faith, it has to be word-based. Amen. In line with the word. Now, you can see how you can even have spoken words and people not believe it. Zacharias didn't believe the word of the angel. Abraham did. He believed. Get thee out of thy kindred, thy house, thy, you know, going to place I'll show you. He did. Except he took Lot with him. Disobeyed that part. Disobedience caused you trouble. You might think it won't, but it causes you trouble. Lot caused Abraham trouble. Go back and study it. Go back and just go back and read your, read your Bible. To, to, wow. Kind of like having a V8. Read your Bible. Oh, wow, I could have read my Bible. Amen. Hey, we had a guy back in our church agreeing with his, his name was John. It wasn't Pastor John, but it was another guy named Church John. And he had this woman who called him up all the time. Brother John, what's the word for me? She got one to call him, him just to stop and prophesy and give her a word. Yay. And again, I say unto thee, yay. Bye. Now, go read your Bible. Now, when you study, when you study Abraham, he was told to leave or the Chaldees, go into the place that God said, get thee out of thy father's house and from thy father's kindred. Get away from your kinfolk. But he took Lot with him. And then when he gets to some place, him and Lot's, because God's blessing Abraham, and, and Lot's living around him, he's getting blessed, their servants get to fighting. And not only that, Lot moves into the city. Of Sodom. Abraham gets the, the, the barren land. He still prospers out there because the, the blessing is the blessing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's good. You understand? When you're called and anointed and appointed, you're going to prosper and flourish wherever God puts you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, Lot took the good land and Abraham went over to the bad land and he still prospered. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. So not to dance yeah. over. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Don't dance as wild as I used to. <laughs> Hallelujah. That, that's, that's wild for me now. <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah. You can get the scrubs. And God can still bless you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can get the leftovers and still get blessed. Man, the, 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 that woman said, Lord, the dogs, the crumbs are good enough to get me healed, my daughter healed. Y'all should have been running by now. Because some of you have been thinking, I've been living on crumbs. I'll tell you, sometimes I think our church has been living on the, on, the, on the scraps and the crumbs. But yeah, we're still blessed. I tell you, our doors are still open. Last year, over 1,000 1, to 1,500 churches closed their doors. Every year. 800 to plus ministers lead the ministry of, because of pressures and disappointments and whatevers. But we're still open for business. The Holy Ghost business. Healing the sick business. Casting out devil business. Preaching the word business. Now, back here. So Abraham's still getting blessed. But see, Lot calls him trouble because then God's got to come down and deal with the cities of God, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot's in there. Now, 
And then Lot's wife is so consumed by the culture. They're told not to look back. They're told not to because God, God's, and when, as soon as she turned back, she turned to a pillar of salt. We need to obey God. Yeah. See, people who live by faith obey God. Amen. That one ever big. If you're a real faith person, a woman, man, a woman, you obey God. Amen. I'm just looking at the finished work of Jesus. Now, you've got to obey God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So, but Zacharias wouldn't believe unless he could, you know, he, he just said, I ain't going to believe it. you got to give me some kind. He said, you've got to give me a sign. Yeah. <laughs> and the angel said, I'll give you one. Shut up right. for nine months. Hello? You ain't going to talk. There's your sign. I'll fix this. We're going to nip this one in the bud. Because your mouth can't mess things up here. Boy, I'll tell you what, it'd be tough if a lot of Christians, every time they start talking to them, belief got, went dumb. We'd have to have silent prayer all the time. Going up Pentecostal, we say, anybody got any spoken request? <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, and, and somebody said, well, Brother Pastor, pray for so and so and so and so. Then, we have, then they say, any unspoken request? Everybody, you know how, how women would sit with their arms crossed like this? The arm with the hand would go up like that. Uh, everybody had an unspoken request. Right. Try that at Wendy's this afternoon. I got an unspoken order. <laughs> See what you get when you get to the drive through. <laughs> Here's your unspoken order. Nothing. How much does it cost? Nothing. You didn't get anything. Unspoken request. Sometimes I think Christians need to be struck dumb. Yeah. I'm not talking about dumb here. I'm talking about dumb here. Because your mouth gets you in trouble. Now, what's the, what is your mouth? Your mouth is a thermometer. <coughs> it's what you're full of. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The Bible says, Jesus said this. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Zacharias just didn't believe. He had no faith in him. And when the angel told him, he gave him the best news he could ever have in his life. I want a sign. Get the head to go on. <laughs> Be like some people I know, you know. I got, I got to have an answer. The angel said, you don't want none of this. You can't talk. Hallelujah. Let's look at Romans 4. We're talking about Abraham now. Romans 4, 16 says, Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now this is... This is grammatically structured to say it, but here's what they're saying. Not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles who believe. Okay? That which is the law, the Jews, but to that which is the faith of Abraham. All right? So the promise is to not only the Jew, the, the natural-born Jew, but to the spiritual Jew, the, the faith or the seed of Abraham through faith. Amen? As it is written, I have made the father of many nations before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. And Weymouth translation translates this phrase, who makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. See, faith can make reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Faith talk references things that do not exist as if they did. Y'all hear? Faith talk references things that don't exist as if they did. Now, now, I'm not talking about trying to come up with something to make it say it. I'm talking about a person who's full of faith, talks like, and says things like they really are existing already. Amen. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Being not weak in faith, he considered his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Listen to this, verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he promised 
he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Just think, think about that. Zechariah says, give me a sign. Abraham goes, I believe he said it. He'll fulfill it. I got it. Big difference. I said there's a big difference between having to have a confirmed sign and believing that God said it, he's going to do it. Amen. There's a lot of people who don't do that. You know, in the church now, we're, we're, we're at a point now, you know, people just don't believe anything. They're too busy drinking their latte, eating their Krispy Kreme while the sermon's going on. Talking to their friends about last week's events. But they're there at church satisfying their spirit. You're not going to grow without hearing the word. You're not going to grow without being a doer of the word. You're not going to achieve. And then when everything comes along, they just go, well, God had a reason. God didn't have a reason for doing that stuff to you. The reason it happened is because you weren't doing what you're supposed to do. You're not successful because you weren't saying what the Bible says. You didn't, you didn't overcome because you didn't do what the Bible says. Right. Amen. I know that's, well, that's not harsh, that's Bible. Amen. We need to stop man be pan being around and trying to keep people's feelings from getting hurt and letting them run off, you know, well, they'll leave and run off to the, you know, the happy, clappy church until disaster shows up. Then they come back here. There you go. Right. Have, all the time. Amen. Happens all the time. Get phone calls when they get people get into the crisis of life. You know who they're calling? You're the foundation. You're the one to put the foundation in my life. You're this. You're that. I need, you know. We minister to them, get them back on their feet, and they go back out. Well, praise the Lord. You know, but the fact of the matter is, you if you want to live and have success in life, you can't live in and out, in and out, in and out, and be and have a consistent, victorious life. Anybody can be consistent and have victory when there's nothing going on. Are you here? Past few years, the economy has not been good. People are struggling. Amen? I mean, and you, you know, and, 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 and the African-American community is suffering at about 6 or 7% more unemployment than, than the white community. They're, they're, they're hit the hardest. The African-American community has been hit the hardest by, what, by the economy. By far. White unemployment is somewhere around 6.7, somewhere around. Black unemployment is 14 point something. So in, in, in certain segments of our country, it's even worse, you know. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't put your trust in the government. And you can't put your trust in the savior of, of, of a politician. I don't care what party you're in. You're going to have to put your trust and your faith in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his word, and trust him to deliver you and trust him to bring you out and quit trusting, you know, the, the, the taxpayers of the United States of America because that is a limited resource that's about to go under. Our GDP is almost 100% of our tax, in, of our revenues. I mean, not our revenue, our, 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 um, our debt is almost 100% of our revenues, of our GDP. It's like 87, 88 percent. It's, got, it's gotten way up there. Eventually, it's going to run out. And then who are you going to trust? You're going to have to start trusting God. And you may as well start now. You may as well start believing the word and acting on the word and believing that the word's so. Amen? And the word works. And God will do what he said. And be like Abraham instead of Zacharias. Said, instead of saying, show me something or I'm going to the line to get signed up for something. Say, I'm signing up right here today. Amen. I'm signing up for some Mark 11, 23, and 24. I'm signing up. Amen. Amen for some Acts, some, some book of Acts events. Acts 10, 38. I'm signing up for 1 Peter 2, 24. You know, I, I, you know, I don't, I, you know, socialized medicine and health care and all that stuff. I got Jesus care. We got to start believing God. We've got to be like Abraham, who against hope believed in hope. Amen? Are you here? Who against hope believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations. What? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And he goes down here and says, he staggered not at the promise of God. When's the last time you took your Bible and saw something in there and you went, wow, you staggered? Come on now, be real. 
you staggered. How many have read some of the miracles of the Old Testament and staggered? Axe heads floating. Rivers splitting. Seas splitting. Come on now. Chariots coming down and picking up prophets. You know what's happening? That reasoning's trying to get in there and talk you out of the miracle God. God put those things in there to produce a faith in you that God's a God of miracles. So that you can act on them. When you need a miracle, you can get a miracle. But it's hard to get a miracle when you don't believe in miracles. And I'm going to tell you something. A miracle is more than a pretty sunset. We all, we, we want, we want, see, we've, we've uh, relegated miracles to carnal, natural things. It's a miracle drug. I got a miracle drug, Jesus. Are you here? Miracles are divine intervention into the ordinary course and affairs of man by God. God has all kinds. Of, have, you, have you read your Bible and staggered? You keep reading. You, you need to keep meditating. You need to keep believing. And stop watching television documentaries on why the miracles of the Bible aren't really miracles. They were some natural phenomenon. Why? Because it'll mess up your head. And your reasoning will get involved. And then when you need a miracle, all you can think of is <clears throat> the water was only six inches deep there. Or that bush has a gas in it and it blows up and burns. That, that's, what, that's how they explain the burning bush. That, that, that's a, a documentary on television. Are you here? You've gone home. Hollywood doesn't get the Bible accurate. Even, even the epics, Cecil B. DeMille's the Ten Commandments, as much as I love that movie and it's cool and has a cool red, splitting of the Red Sea, was as inaccurate as they can be in some cases. How do you know? Because the Bible says in the book of Psalms that when they came out of Israel, Egypt, there was no feeble one among them. They had blind folk and, with, and carried out people on stretchers and all this kind. That wasn't Bible. Why? Because they got under the blood, got the lamb in them and the blood over them. They came out under their own steam. I don't care who they were. You go read your Bible. Amen. We got to get back to letting the Word of God infiltrate our minds, infiltrate, renewing our minds to the Word, so it it produces a renewed mind. Why? So we can prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Our minds no longer reason with the, with carnal thinking. The Bible says this: the wisdom of this world is for earthly, sensual, and devilish. All that to say that, but, but let me paraphrase that. The wisdom of this world is antichrist. It is opposed to the knowledge of God. The Paul even wrote and said to the church that the carnal mind is enmity against the things of God. Hello? There was James. James is wisdom of this world, the earthly essential, but... Uh, uh, it's not from above, the earthly essential, the devilish. Find the one either before or right after that. The wisdom of God is peaceable. Yeah. Or after. Somewhere in there it talks about the, peace, the, the, the wisdom of God is easy to be entreated, peaceable. See, the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. The carnal mind is enmity against God. But it's always resisting. Always resisting. When you start talking about miracle signs and wonders, the carnal mind goes... Eh. Even born again believer who, who, who are deacons on the deacon board at the such and such church goes. Eh. I remember one time we were playing softball back in, in our hometown of Greenville, North Carolina, and we, we, our church joined the softball league. Now, we joined the softball league with all the other non Holy Ghost believing churches. One other church was in there, church we came out of, the Pentecostal church was in there. But the other, the other ones didn't believe in anything. Now here's how they did it. Now here's how they do it down in Greenville area. About softball season, all the people who can really play start going to Sunday school at the church. So that the pastor will sign the piece of paper that says they attend our church. And they stack their teams. And so they can win the church league because it's really important to get the banner in your church. So at the end of the season, 
All the people who smoke, drink, and cuss all through the softball season, when they're not on the softball field, and sometimes they do even on the softball field because it's the church league, leave and don't come back until next season. That's how it's done. Because they think, you know, they, they think it's going to be an outreach to them. They, and they, they show up on Sunday, they come to Sunday school, run outside and smoke their cigarette and go back in for the sermonette. I mean, you know, that's how, that's how it works. Now, that's just how, that's how I grew up. I, that's, when our church joined, <clears throat> one of our guys slid in the second and got hurt. And Sonny, Brother Sonny, started praying for him. Brother Sonny Lancaster. He, he, he tells Sister Debbie Zabowski, he says, Sister Deborah, you got to do He is Jehovah one more time. We could not have worship for three years without He is Jehovah. I mean, it, it, however she tried not to do it, we had, he'd stop her before you take up the office. Sister Deborah, we got to do He is Jehovah. And she would do it. Dun, 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 He is Jehovah. I mean, we just, here we go. Because yeah, everybody danced. We just danced. We're just hallelujah. Well, guy from the other team standing there, we're, we're praying for the guy. He turns around and walks up. I ain't going to have nothing to do with this junk. Now, wait a second. You may not understand it, but calling, praying, and doing what the Bible says junk located you real quick. Are you here? See, our churches are full of that. And we wonder why there's no miracles and there's no signs and there's no wonders and people aren't clamoring to get in. And now they're clamoring to get in to the hip-hop, you know, cool, cool culture church that doesn't have any requirements. Because they, they here's the thing. My son was talking about a revival. Steve Rigglesworth told Summerall, he said, I see, I see revivals coming. He said, there'll be a revival of the Spirit. The healing revival came. And the charismatic renewal came on the heels of that. Remember, the healing revival started about 1947, last to 1958. After that came, for two or three years, what they called the latter rain. And, and then right after that came the charismatic renewal in the early 60s. Okay? And he said, I see a revival of the word following that. About 1971, 72, began what we refer to as a teaching revival. Lasted 15 years plus or so. And we've been in a lull because he saw one more revival. So they saw a revival of the Word and the Spirit coming together. That would be the last great revival. We haven't seen it yet. We're in a law. And in that law, here's, I know I'm, I'm, I'm venturing a little bit off my subject matter, but I'm here. I've got to go because that's where the Holy Ghost is leading me. Here's what happens in laws between revivals. People are so busy looking for the next one. When I say revivals, they're, they're moved. And they're, listen. <clears throat> semantically, whatever you want to say, God does stuff all the time and he's consistently with, has the things available, but there are emphasis by the Spirit on things. Because either the church has walked away from it, the church isn't living in it, whatever. But the problem is, people are always looking for the, for, to live from move to move. And so when there's a law between an emphasis, what we're supposed to be doing is living on what he, you just got. Does that make sense? You're not supposed to be just, okay, that's over. Let's go. You know, Laughter's over. <clears throat> What's the next thing? You kind of like those philosophers who are always looking for the next greatest teaching. Amen? But when you get into a law, everything in the world comes down the pipe. And because people are looking for something instead of living in something, they jump on all kinds of bandwagons. So in the past 15 years, we've had the warring tongues. We've had the army of God. We've had, oh, good gracious sakes, what else have we had? I, I, I've lost track of so many of them. Huh? Confession, people. Well, I, I, confession. Um, but, you know, we had the army of God. You know, people for, well, come to church with fatigues. Had the warring tongues. <clears throat> going up in helicopters and fighting against devils in the atmospheres. Renting the top building of the Jefferson Pilot building and going there and fighting devils up there. And, and, and you, got, you got the... Grace revival. And we got the seeker sensitive revival. So or a move. Okay? You know, the drinking wine move. That's a move in the church. Oh, yeah. People trying to prove they can drink wine. Why? Why are people fighting so they can do something instead of fighting to do what the Bible says? We, need, we just need to spend more time doing what the Bible says and trying to prove we can live in, live in sin or live as close to sin as we can get. But there's, a, there's, there's, there's something coming. It's a coming. And it's going to be a mixing of the word. I'm going to tell you something. 
that what God does to wrap this up for the church age is not going to be how big is your rock climbing wall in your, children, in your youth ministry. It's not going to be how cool is your, is your um, and how modern is your worship and how, what kind of fog show or light show you got. I'm telling you, what God's going to do to wrap all this up is going to be the Holy Ghost and the Word. Now, I don't care if you've got light shows and, and fog machines and all that. Like, that that's irrelevant. But if you think that that, that that is God's move, you're, you're sadly mistaken. Because what God's going to do is going to be something else. There'll be no mistake in God's doing what he's doing in the earth. See, there was 1,500 years of silence between the prophets and the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus showed up, history has recorded that it's undeniable. That the world itself couldn't contain the volumes of the books of the things he did. Not everybody believed. But there's no doubt about God was in this. When John the Baptist came a preaching, people were coming out. They're hungry. Amen? <clears throat> things are coming our way. Revival, a revival, revival. Listen, it's already happening in other places of the planet. But it's coming to America. America's got to have, gotta have a, a restoration by the Spirit of God of people who live by faith who don't go to church to appease their conscience or skip church because they're tired of the games. We're going to have to live by faith and not by sight. Can you say amen? And if you don't live by faith and not by sight, you're not going to win. I said you're not going to win. We want to win. I want to win. I want to live in victory. I want to see six, Listen success in serving and pleasing and honoring God and his favor come on me because I'm doing what he said to do. Amen? All right, I know we, died, we, we diverged a little bit there at the end, but praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you that you're working in our midst. We thank you that tonight we're, we're trusting you for manifestations of, in the realm of the ministry of gifts of healings and manifestation of healing. We just go ahead and acknowledge that we give you that service as we do all services, but we're, we're looking for a special because you told us to do this, so we're just following your instruction. We're expecting uh, demonstrations, signs, wonders, miracles in the realms of healing and miracles in people's bodies. In Jesus' name, we thank you for that. We thank you for a special service tonight. Thank you for what's taking place today and for that which takes place in the people's hearts because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.